21st Precinct, Sergeant. Inspector who? Oh, yes, sir, Inspector. The detail is assembling here. I don't know, sir. Lieutenant King of the 21st Squad is in charge. You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct. The nerve center. An important case is about to break. Superior officers have been notified. They're assembling from their homes, from social functions, from all over the city. You will follow the action taken pursuant to these notifications from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Yes, sir. The brass has all been notified. They can start out any time. Yes, sir, any time now. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I'd been off duty since 6 o'clock. I was not due back at the station house until 4 p.m. the next afternoon when I would work straight through until 8 the following morning. At 6.30, I met my wife at Frank and Norman's, a steakhouse on 54th Street near Broadway. We had dinner and took a cab to the 46th Street Theater to see the hit musical Guys and Dolls, an occasion we had both looked forward to for a year. The first act was fine. certainly been worth waiting for. Mm. You want a cigarette? We go down to the lounge. All right. I want to call in anyway. Oh, uh, excuse us, please. I'm sorry. Pardon us, please. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Watch your step now, Ellen. Oh, I feel like dancing up the aisle. I can hardly wait for the second act. Well, ten minutes isn't such a long time. According to the Manual of Procedure, a precinct commander, although off-duty, is never relieved of the responsibility of his command. Consequently, he's obliged to keep the desk officer informed regarding his whereabouts. If he's beyond the reach of a telephone, he's required to call in at frequent intervals to be notified of any matter that would require his attention. Ellen and I went downstairs to the theater lounge. I offered her a cigarette, lit one for myself. Then I stepped into the phone booth. This is Captain Kennelly, Sergeant. Oh, hello, Captain. Good you called. Well, what have we got? Well, you know those three guys who escaped from the federal penitentiary in Pennsylvania and robbed a bank in the Bronx? Yeah. Well, I think they got them spotted. In the precinct? Yes. 611 East 67th Street. The information came to one of our men walking a post over there. Farrell. Good. Are they sure it's them? Well, they must be. The detectives are getting ready to hit the place. Well, I want you to notify division on it. And uh, put me through to Lieutenant King. Uh, you got a couple of messages here, Captain. Well, hold them till I get in, Sergeant. Yes. Hold on. I'll connect you upstairs. 21st Squad. Detective DeFeo. Well, let me talk to Lieutenant King, please. Lieutenant King's busy right now. Can I help you? This is Captain Kennelly. Oh, hold on, Captain. Lieutenant Captain Kennelly on two. He's coming to me. Okay. Lieutenant King. Hello, Matt. What do we got? Three bank robbers and escaped convicts hold up on East 67th Street. How does it look? It's them, Captain. Information came to one of your men, Johnny Farrell. Yeah, I know. Uh, what time are you going to hit the place? Late as possible, 4 or 5 a.m. probably. All right, I'm coming in. I'll be there in 20 minutes. I'll see you. So long, Matt. Frank, that took long enough. Did it? What happened? Did the roof fall in, you always say? Well, I've got to go in, Ellen. Oh, Frank. Now, you stay and see the rest of the show. It'll be over at 11 o'clock. Can't you stop by on your way home? No, this is important. 
Here's the car check, honey. You know the garage is parked in on 53rd. And what time do you think you'll be home? Oh, I don't know. Haven't any idea. I'm sorry, honey. Sorry to have to ruin your evening. Why can't it ever happen when we're not having a good time? Uh, beats me, honey. I'll see you at home. Good night, Frank. After 16 years in the job, Ellen was used to that sort of thing. She didn't complain. She just made the best of it. I went up to the street and flagged a cab to take me to the station house. Traffic across town was light. Cab had me in front of the station house in less than 10 minutes. I saw two patrol cars parked at the curb. One was ours. The other belonged to ESD. The street was quiet. I walked up the worn granite steps to the station house and into the muster room. At the desk, Lieutenant Gorman was booking a prisoner in the custody of a detective I didn't know. The suspect looked like an addict. The detective must have been from the narcotics squad. A half dozen patrolmen were gathered in a group at the far end of the muster room, talking quietly. I walked over to the far end of the desk where Sergeant Klein was on the boxes. Hello, Captain. Who are those men, Sergeant? Oh, them? They were sent in here from the 19th and 23rd on special detail. You know, for the raid. Excuse me, Captain. Yep. Yeah. 21st Precinct, Sergeant. Yeah, where are you? Well, listen, uh, walk around the corner to 331 and see the super. He's called in here twice about a couple on the third floor fighting and breaking the furniture. Yeah, okay, let me know. Those men know what they're here for? I know they're not yet. That's what they're probably trying to figure out. Well, I don't want them standing around in here jabbering. Tell them to go into the back room. Yes, sir. Now, listen, you men. Yes, Go on in the back room there and make yourselves comfortable. You'll be here a while yet. Thank you, You notify the division? Yes, sir. I spoke to the division lieutenant. He'll get in touch with Chief Andrea. Those are the guys holed up there. That'll be a pretty good caller. Yeah, it should be. What else is doing around here? Oh, nothing much. It's pretty quiet, too, otherwise. You got a couple of messages. Um, what? One from CB over the teletype. A meeting of all precinct commanders in the lineup room at 2.40, Wednesday, 9 a.m. I left the communication on your desk. Okay. There's a fellow named Fox called twice. He wouldn't give his first name. He wanted your home number. I asked him what it was about. He said it was personal. I didn't give him your number. I told him you would do back on at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. He'll call in. All right. I'm going upstairs. Oh, uh, oh, Captain. Yeah? It was Johnny Farrell who got the information. Yeah, you told me that. Oh, did I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Where is Farrell, I'm told? Uh, no, sir. Lieutenant King said that since it was his line, he could come along when they hit the place. He changed the civilian clothes, and he's upstairs. I put Melito on his post. All right, I'll check with you later. Yes, sir. I left the muscle room and headed toward the stairs to the 21st squad on the second floor. In the back room, the special details from the 19th and 23rd were gathered around in little groups whispering, wondering what their job for the night would be. On the way upstairs, I grinned at the way everyone was so careful to point out that the information on the three bank robber SKPs came to patrolman Johnny Farrell. Johnny Farrell had been caught smoking on post by his sergeant the night before. The report was on my desk for disciplinary action. Inside the 21st squad, nine or ten detectives were standing around in small groups. I recognized a few of them as men who worked out of the 21st. The others had been brought in from detective district headquarters and from the main office. In a corner near the fingerprint stand, sitting all by himself, was patrolman Johnny Farrell. Hi, Captain. Hi. Hello, Johnny. Uh, hello, Captain. Well, looks like a big night. Yes, sir. I'd have to get a line on these boys. No way in particular. Just threw a kid on the block there, a kid named Wano. Yeah? Smoke, Johnny? Thanks. You know, I was going to give him up after last night. <laughs> you should. Thanks. It's kind of hard. Yeah, it is. Well, this kid, he's kind of little for his age, 13 or 14. He's not so good uh, with the English. <laughs> I pulled him out of a scrape last week with two bigger boys. They were about to tear him apart. So I've been his best friend on the block since. Yeah. Anyway, tonight about 7.30, I saw one on the street. And he said, hey, Policia, you my friend. I got $2 you hold for me, huh? So they don't take it away from me, the big fellows? Yeah. That's waving $2 bills at me. I said, where'd you get it, Wano? He said, uh, oh, I don't steal it, Policia. I don't steal it. I earn it from the man's. I said, what men? He told me about the three men who were staying in the flat across the hall from him. Mm -hmm. said one of them opened the door when he came out in the hall, asked him how he'd like to make some money. The guy gave him $3, sent him over to Times Square to buy some Philadelphia papers, last week's papers. Well, he brought the papers back. They cost less than a dollar, and the man told him to keep the rest. I put two and two together. I saw the alarms. Read about the bank robbery up in the Bronx yesterday. Yeah. 
Well, I knew the same three guys had been made in a couple of jobs in Philadelphia. I knew they broke out of a federal penitentiary. I started asking one of a few questions about the man. It looked pretty good to me, so I called in. Mm-hmm. Told Sergeant Klein about it. He connected me with Lieutenant King up here. Guess it looked pretty good to him, too. He told me to come in and bring Wano, and that's it. Where's this kid, Wano? Oh, well, uh, Lieutenant King didn't want him on the block tonight. The lieutenant was going up to the stadium with his brother. His brother works for Con Ed. Yeah. Well, when this came up, he couldn't go. So he had his brother take the kid on the other ticket. Wano thought that was a great idea. I do, too. How'd they make sure it's the right three? Well, after Lieutenant King talked to Wano for a while, he sent one of his men over and got the super of the building and somebody else, another neighbor in here. Super had gotten a good look at one of them, so it's definite. Good. Good work, Johnny. I understand you're going along when we hit the place. You bet. Okay, I'm going in to talk to Lieutenant King. Uh, who's that in there with him? That's a super captain. I think he's getting a layout of the building, you know. Yeah, all right. I'll see you. And uh, do your smoking at the right time, will you? Yeah, Captain. Sure. Oh, Matt. Oh, hello, Captain. Come in. Want to shut the door? Yeah. This is Mr. Albert Acosta, Captain Tonelli. Oh, it's glad to know you. How are you? Mr. Costa is a super for both 609 and 611. Yeah, that's right. We're just going over the layout of the buildings in that flat. They're in 611? Yeah, that's right, on the top floor, uh, fourth floor rear. Let's see if I got this straight now. Both 609 and 611 are four-story buildings. The building to the east, 613, are five stories. Uh, yeah, that's right, but uh, that's not my building, uh, 613. Does the uh, fire escape, do all the fire escapes go all the way up to the roof, Mr. Acosta? Oh, yeah, that, that's right, up to the roof and down to the ground. And from the window of the flat they're in? Yeah, that's right. Your roofs are on the same level? Uh, the same level, yeah. They're, they're both four stories. What separates the two buildings on the roof? Oh, a little brick wall, uh, this high. Three feet high? Oh, three feet, three and a half feet, something. On uh, the roof to 613? Uh, that's not my building. Um, but it's five stories high. Uh, yeah, 613. Then in other words, from the roof of 611, you can't get to the roof of 613. There's a wall 10 or 12 feet high. Yeah, that's right. 10, 12, 14 feet, something. No windows in that wall? Uh, let's see, uh... No, no, no windows. Anything on your roof? Well, nothing. Uh, television area. Hmm. All right, Mr. Costa. I want to talk to you again later. You hungry? You want something to eat? Uh, could I, uh... Could I get a can of beer? Well, the lunch in that we take from doesn't have beer. Oh. Well, all right, coffee. Uh, coffee and a Danish. Why don't you take care of Mr. Costa, will you? Send down for what he wants to eat. Right. That detective over there will take care of you, Mr. Carson. Okay, uh, glad, uh, glad to know you, Captain. Yeah, same here. Well, how does it look, man? Oh, uh, Sam, there's no doubt about it. In addition to the kid and the super, we found three people who made the pictures. All of them? No, just one. Just one goes out in the street, but one's good enough for me. This one. Carl Roth. Mm. If he's identified and there's two more guys in the flat, it's got to be the others. Whose flat is it? Did they rent it? No, it belongs to a couple of sisters, Marie and Lois Gunny. Costa says they've been living there for three or four years. The one sister, Marie, has been in Bellevue Hospital for months, six weeks, alcoholic ward. Oh. They're young, too, in their 20s. The other sister, Lois, is still living there. Costa says he thinks she works as a waitress someplace, doesn't know where. Is she up in the flat now? Beats me, Captain. Nobody has gone out or come in since we got onto this thing. We've got the place staked out. Two neighbors that know her with the officers. They haven't seen her. Well, how about Bellevue? Is she down visiting her sister? Well, yeah, we checked that out, too. We've got a man there. Well, how are you going to hit him? There's three rooms in that flat. It's in the back of the building and on the top floor. These boys are tough. There's no question about that. They had two guns apiece when they hit that bank. They roughed up a lot of people around Philadelphia. They were doing 25 years each when they broke. They're not going to sit still for a collar. It's going to be a hot one. Well, if they're on the top floor, you can't put anyone on the roof of 611. They'll be heard walking around. I know. We'll have men on the roofs of 609 and 613 in case they come up the fire escape. Well, that's the way they'll probably go when they hear the law at the front door. Who's going to hit the door? Myself, Johnny Farrell, if he wants to. You want to. And one or two others. Including me? Yes, sir. I've got two men from the emergency squad detailed. They'll be there with access to work in the door if they give us a fight. All right. What time? I figure 4 a.m. There'll be less people on the street and less people up and around in the building. Also, these guys might be sound asleep by then. If we can nail them when they're asleep or at least sleepy, there's not so much chance of fireworks. How about your notifications? They're all made. The brass will start streaming in here about midnight. There's uh, six or eight cops from the 19th and 23rd down in the back room now. Yeah, I know. Uh, how much of the show did you get to see? It's a shame. Come in. Uh, Lieutenant, Whitey says the bail is on three. Wants to talk to you? Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Yep. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. 
Yeah, Dee. We got the girl in Lois Denny. Uh, we got her as she was walking into the house. Good, Dee. Fine. She's not so fine, Lieutenant. She told me they were expecting her home at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock at the latest. Shall I bring her in, Lieutenant? Uh, no. Where are you? I'm using the phone in Mix's funeral chapel around the corner. Who's there? Just Mix. Okay, D, stay there. We'll be right over. We got trouble, Captain. Oh? They got the girl. Ross and them expect her back in the flat no later than 11. You can't wait until 4 a.m., Matt. You'll have to hit right away. As soon as possible. What about all the brass? They've been notified for 4 a.m. We can't wait, Matt. We'll notify them again. That's all. It's been moved up. Okay. Whitey, Ben, Al. Come in here, huh? What's up? All right, now listen. We're making a change. We've got to move and move quick. Got to hit them as soon as possible. Then get hold of ESG. You are listening right to now. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city. A new gen- Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Frank Kennelly. Although we knew hardly more than her name, Lois Dunny had become the key to the situation. The fugitives expected her to return by 11 p.m. If she didn't show up, they might suspect she'd been apprehended. Lieutenant King got his detectives ready to spring immediately. I gave final instructions to the uniformed officers who were going to assist. And then together, we drove up 2nd Avenue to Mix's funeral chapel. Okay, this is good. Captain? Go ahead, man. Find a place to park and walk on back here. Yes, okay. Yeah, that's a great place to start out from, Undertaker. Better to start out from there, man. Okay, you got a point. Go ahead. Please, it's air conditioning. There they are. Back in the office. Not a bad looking head? No, not too bad. Hello, Dave. Hello, Lieutenant. Captain. Hi, Dave. This is Lois Dunny. How are you? Hello. You're in a big jam, you know that, don't you, miss? Yes, I suppose so. No supposing about it, you are. That's Carl Ross up in your apartment, isn't it? Yes. And the others? I showed you the pictures of all of them, Lieutenant. She identified them. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just rented out some rooms to those boys for a little money. Anybody's entitled to make a little money. Not that much. How much? They've been there three days. They've already given her $275. Didn't you know who they were? No. Now, don't lie to us. You knew who they were. They knew you. Or at least one of them did. Which one? I didn't know them. Now, look, come off it. I told you you were in a jam. If you don't start telling us the truth, you'll be in a bigger jam. I'm not kidding. Now, how about it? Who are you, anyway? i got to know who I'm talking to. My name is Lieutenant King. This is Captain Kennelly. Is that good enough for you? I've been telling you the truth. Listen, you're a pretty bad liar. I'm going to tell this officer to take you downtown. Dee, float her in the car. Matt, wait a minute. Look, miss, you're not doing yourself a bit of good. All we want is the truth. You tell us the truth, and I'll see that you get every break you're entitled to. Which one did you know, Lois? Carl. I knew Carl. For how long? I worked in Pittsburgh a while, a couple of years ago. I knew him then. But I didn't know he was anything like what he is. Honest, I didn't. Not then. When did you hear? After he got in trouble. I was back in New York. Somebody wrote me. One of my friends. If you have time to wait, the facts eventually will develop. But we had neither time to wait nor time to waste. There are two ways to get information quickly. One is to be stern, the other is to be full of sympathy. Most often, a lying witness will turn to the friendly officer and tell him exactly what he wants to know. I haven't heard from him in, in, in years, but one day there he is. He just turns up in the cafe where I work. There he is. By himself? Yeah, by himself then. When was that? Tuesday, last Tuesday. I read about him and about how he and those others broke out of there and what they did in Philadelphia and all that. Weren't you scared? No, not too. I told you, when I knew him in Pittsburgh, he seemed like a very nice boy. He was very nice to me. And did you ask him anything about that? Yeah, sure. Naturally. And he said that everybody had him and his friends wrong. They didn't mean any harm. Well, I mean, you know, he's good-looking. He likes to spend money. How'd they come to stay in your flat? That was the first thing he asked me. Did I know where he and his friends could get a place? Well, my sister's been in the hospital, and I had a big place all by myself, so I told him, I told Carl, I told him, if you want to, I've got a big place with an extra bedroom and all that and a shelf in the living room, so they said okay, and that was that. How'd they know you wouldn't go to the police? I don't know. Carl vouched for me with the others, I guess. 
They paid me all this money, and they promised to give me 500 more when they left. I guess they figured I wanted the 500. You did, too, didn't you? Well, I mean, my sister was in the hospital. I didn't have a nickel except what I made, sure. They expect you home at 11 o'clock? Around 11, yes. Yeah. Why 11? Well, this is my late night on. I work until 10. Carl knows that. You ever see any guns up there? Well... Did you lose? Yes, I've got guns. How many? I don't know. I don't plenty. But I never counted them. I was too scared to get near them. I don't like guns. Have you got your key to the place? Yeah, I got it, but it won't do you any good. They keep the door bolted from the inside all the time. Listen, Carl told me he said no matter what, he wasn't going back. The others, too. They said they'd die on the spot first and kill anybody who wants to argue with him about it. Cops, they meant. Yeah, I figured that's who they meant. In another few minutes of interrogation, we had all the information we needed about the interior of Lois Dunning's flat and what we could expect to find there. Lois Dunning was taken to the precinct house in the custody of a detective. Meanwhile, nearly 50 uniformed officers and detectives assigned to the detail were given their posts and told of their duties. Four men were assigned to the roofs of 609 and 613. Eight men were posted in various places in front of and across the street from 611. Four men were assigned to the rear courtyard behind 611. Men from the emergency service division set up a portable generator floodlight on the roof directly across the rear courtyard of 611 so that the entire fire escape could be spotlighted. Another such unit was held in readiness for use in front of the house. Besides their service revolvers, these men were issued such additional arms as their particular situation called for. Submachine guns, riot guns, and tear gas. Lieutenant King, myself, Johnny Farrell, two other detectives from the 21st Squad, three men from ESD, two carrying axes, another a submachine gun, led the way into 611. Behind us followed a half dozen or so other officers. As we walked up the dim-lit stairs, two men dropped off on each floor to block any attempted escape and to keep curious tenants out of harm's way. Two more were left at the top of the stairs in the fourth-floor hallway. The rest of us walked to the fourth-floor rear. We stopped at the door. We listened. The radio was on inside. Okay. Who is it, Lois? We're police officers. Open up. It's cops. Do they use power to kill Open up, police officers. Knock it in. Use those axes. All right, come on. Hit the lock. Hit the lock. Let go. Push it in. Come on, let's go. In the living room, there they are. Give up, we're through. Hold it. All right, so let's go. Give me that one. There they are. Nail them, Johnny. There they are, cop. Chief. Yellow son. How about it? I'm set. Let's go. There they are, get him. Hold them. Pull them out. You lousy. Chief. Bring that brownie up here. Get him. Let's go. There's the other one. Out the window. Hold up. Hold up, Ross. Up the fire, Let's go. Watch it, Matt. Stay away, Cop. You okay, Matt? Yeah, I'm okay. Watch it up there, man. One's on his way up. Just one. Duck. He's on the roof. Come on. There I go. He's on the roof. Archie, Archie, he's going for the ventilator. Yeah. Where is it? It's me. There he is. Behind the ventilator. Behind the ventilator. Let's get him. Gun out here. All right, you men. Put your light on the ventilator. That's fine. That's it. Right out here, Rod. All right. Here it comes. Okay, let's go. Watch him. We should have another one. Stand there, Ross. Get up again. Sir. All right. Take it easy. 
Nothing on him. Too many of you. There's too many of you. Maybe. But now at least there's three less like you. The toll was heavy. Two of the three fugitives were dead on the floor of the living room. Ross had a bullet through his shoulder. They weren't the only ones. Detective Carmine DeFeo, 21st Squad, dead. Patrolman John Fowl, 21st Precinct, wounded. 45 slug in the left hip. Patrolman Ezra Davis, Emergency Service Squad Number 4, wounded. 38 slug through the left hand. The medical examiner and ambulances were summoned. The top command of both the uniformed and detective divisions came to the scene. At 2.15 a.m., I arrived back at the station house. There, I approved the unusual occurrence report and checked on the notification of the relatives of the wounded personnel under my command. At 2.35 a.m., conferences were held in my office with the top commanders of the department in connection with a special report concerning the incident. Subsequently, the press sought additional material and photographs. At 3.50, I signed the blotter and left the precinct house. Deputy Chief Inspector DeAndrea gave me a ride as far as Kew Gardens. There, I got a cab and went home. At 4.40 a.m., I unlocked the front door of the house as quietly as I could manage. I walked through the living room into the bedroom. Frank? Yeah, honey? Oh, what time is it? Late. Are you tired? Yep, kind of. You know what? What? You missed a very exciting show. Yeah, honey. I bet I did. Uh... 21st Precinct, Sergeant. Where do you need an ambulance? 822? Is that in the building? Or on the street. What apartment number? What's the trouble there? How was he hurt? Was he stabbed? Incidents portrayed tonight on 21st Precinct occurred last year. Names were changed to protect the interests of persons involved. 21st Precinct is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association of the City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Joan Loring and Barbara Weeks, Lawson Zerbe, Bill Lipton, Wendell Holmes, and Mandel Kramer. Written and directed by Stanley Niss, produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hannah speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>